We thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for the people that you've put in our lives. I thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. Lord, I really, I, I thank you for the wisdom in this fellowship. I thank you, Lord, that you put time before the foundation of the world. You put time into thinking about our futures, each particular plan for our life. You took time. You delicately placed your hands upon our life. Lord, I thank you for the time and the thought that you put into each and every one of our lives. And it's in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. We want to welcome you to New Covenant Grace Fellowship in Inverness, Florida today. And uh, we're looking forward to just receiving some tremendous things from the Lord as far as, as uh, the Word of God goes. We, we know that Jesus is the Word, but He has given us truth in His Bible, and we can, we can just learn so much from that. Um, for those of you that are watching, uh, I'm, I'm beginning reports back from just all over the world now that the people are watching our messages on, on the Internet, on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. And we, we're just so thankful for you, and we're thankful for what God is doing in your life, and we're thankful for the opportunity from this little church in Citrus County, Florida, to be able to have a message that is changing lives around the world. And some of the emails, thank you for the emails and the testimonies that you send me. It means a lot to us because it, it, it's, we're, not, we're not wasting our effort. And so we're just so very thankful for that. And uh, I want to introduce to you for a moment... Um, the guy who makes this all happen. Um, Matthew, come on up. This is Matthew Alcorn. He is, our, he is our director of media ministry here. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to, we have a dead microphone. Do we have someone at the soundboard that can? Never. Can you get Dave real quickly to turn this on? That's okay, folks. We have our, our uh, technical difficulties. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this is the guy, Matthew Elkhorn from Suncoast Media Partners, that makes this all happen. We want to introduce him to you all. You all know this and those that watch us on YouTube, but uh, we have a YouTube channel with over 90 videos. Hi, Kathy. How are you doing? <laughs> uh, and we're being watched from, by people all over the world. We know we have viewers in Australia. We have a num number of people in Germany watching, too. But... Uh, if you ever go on YouTube and you were to type in the search uh, thing at the top, New Covenant Grace Fellowship, we pretty much are at the top. And you can find our channel because there's a yellow square with the name of our church in it. Uh, and often, also, which will come up, are a bunch of the actual video messages. And you'll see the little picture thumbnail, and you'll know it because it will usually be his face. There's a variety with her face. And there's a couple with... His face. And that's bad. And I'm looking for Joe. There's a couple with Joe's face. So um, it's a really great resource. They're all available. Our, one of the great things about YouTube is it tells me who's watching and how many people. And one of the things they have is they call it the 28-day viewer average. And ours has been going up over the last few months. And right now it's over 500 and it just, it, you know, it just keeps every 28, you know, just it, every day it shows you the new 28-day average. So please, if you're watching our messages on YouTube, s hello, uh, comment on these messages, please. Share these messages and uh, like them. There's a little thumb, thumbs up button you can click. <laughs> Thanks, Earl. And uh, you can click on that too. So we appreciate it and it helps spread the word and especially... When we're out of town and you want to stay in touch, you can get on YouTube and see them. Uh, Larry used to watch it on DirecTV. We watch it on my TV because I have an Xbox, and we can watch it through YouTube on the television. So it's really available everywhere. So Very thanks good. for watching, and you know, keep up with us. Yeah, let's give this guy a hand, huh? Thank you. I'm, I'm so thrilled with this because of the, we have the first class production. I was watching some other, I mean, I'm not being critical or anything, but I was watching some production on some commercial stuff 
on, uh, on the internet here the other day and I thought, my lands, ours is so, the quality, and when you watch the high definition picture of this, um, it's just amazing. You know, we're, it's just, just amazing. So thank you, brother, we appreciate that. I want to look at this morning part two of a message that we're calling, we started last week, we're called the, the River of Grace. And um, um, I want to uh, just review a little bit um, to start this thing off. And that is, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Ezekiel, the 47th chapter. And this is talking about the river of God. Um, when Corinne and I were traveling the country for 12 years, we used this message oftentimes, and especially in new churches that we were ministering in. And we used this and tied it into a revival type message. And we you talked about it from the standpoint of the river being progressive. We'll, we'll see that in a minute, but we use that and, and, and used to teach that revival is likewise progressive, and we would talk about the need for revival. When we began to come into the revelations of what New Covenant grace really is, and when we began to discover what the finished works of the cross really mean, we began to discover that we're no longer seeking revival because we have really been revived. The problem is we just don't know it. And uh, a few weeks ago, now the, the, we used to, now I want you to understand, I, I, I cannot explain to you, we were, some of us were talking about this at lunch yesterday. I cannot explain to you the transition that has taken place, for instance, in Corinne and I in our ministry. When we used to travel the country, we would call ourselves, we would introduce ourselves as revivalists we would bill ourselves as revivalists to this generation or to the small churches of America. We would, we would literally call ourselves revivalists. And what, what we discovered is that most people in the church don't know what revival really is. It's really simple for a church to put up a sign, revival tonight. And they don't have the slightest idea what true revival is. You can't just put a sign up and think that now you have revival. But what we discovered about revival, and this was one of the frustrating things about revival, and I, I have a chapter in my book about this, and this is one of the things that really um, started getting us interested in going in this direction that we're now in, is that oftentimes we would leave meetings and we'd be traveling on the road in our motorhome, going from one church to another across this land someplace, and we would ask each other seriously, and I can't tell you maybe dozens of times over over that period of time, we would ask ourselves, are we really making a difference? Are we really? I mean, as a sacrifice, you know, we left our family behind. My, my wife no, no longer had a home. We lived full time in a motor home all these years and all these kinds of things and, and the time and the expense and all the things we put in. We, we would ask ourselves, are we really making a difference? Is this really worthwhile? And we would see awesome things happen in these churches. The problem was, is, and this, has caused, this caused the question to arise, the, question, the problem was is that we would go back to the church next year maybe, maybe we'd have extended meetings of a dozen weeks or something like that, of meetings every night. That type of thing happened often in our ministry. Okay? And we would go back maybe a year later and everything that we saw deposited during that first trip was completely gone and guess what? Here was the church needing revival again. And so over the last several weeks here, I've got a series, I think it's a three-part uh, series on this, and the title of this was Revival, The Problem with Revival. And, and, and the subtitle was, It is Here Today and Gone Tomorrow. And I'm telling you, that's what it is. You know, can you show me in, in the writings of the New Testament Wherever, did Paul ever teach, for example, revival, the concepts of revival? You need to get revived now, church. You need to get, they were constantly alive because they believed the message that he was preaching to them. Remember, they couldn't even verify it. They couldn't even check them out with the Bible because it didn't exist. 
They couldn't quote the Bible. They couldn't quote these verses because it didn't exist. It was being written as they spoke, as they ministered. You know, it was, it was coming to life from that. But there was something that those early New Testament saints had that I just, I'm sorry, I just do not see in the church of Jesus Christ, and, and especially in America today, but I'll say this worldwide. It doesn't exist. And so this constantly seeking a higher spiritual thing uh, a higher spiritual plane in our life, when we really have the whole nine yards and just don't know it, there's a flaw in that. And so what we saw and what we've been seeing over the last several years as this has become more and more relevant in our church, you know, because this is not what we used to teach. You know, the things that I'm teaching you today, three or four years ago, I would have probably contradicted myself because I didn't believe some of that stuff. But all of a sudden, when you start looking at it and think, well, it's been there all the time. Why we don't believe it? Why the church doesn't believe it? I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm, I've been getting into all kinds of disagreements with people again this week on the law. You know, on the law. They say, well, we're still under law. Or, 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 or there was a big discussion on Facebook. And I kind of started it. But um, <laughs> the discussion was, you know, can anybody show me one verse of Scripture which plainly shows there is a difference between God's moral law and God's ceremonial law. Guess what? It's non-existent. It doesn't exist. But you see, people will come to us, and when we say that the law is no longer in effect, Jesus Christ did away with the law, of course he fulfilled the law. It no longer is an application in our lives. People just do not want to, um, just do not want to, hold on to that, especially when you touch the Ten Commandments or something like that. But yet Paul says very plainly in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that those Ten Commandments, those commandments etched in stone, which were done away with, no longer exist, led to death. But the new way leads to the life in Jesus Christ. I mean, how much plainer does it have to be? But you know what? You, got, you, know, you have these people just kind of fighting for this all the time. And it's primarily because of bad teaching that's been influenced in the church. And, and we're stuck with it. And we now are coming out of some of that stuff. You and I that have been in the church, you know, I, I just so value these children. That's why we're so careful about this in our church here. We want our children to learn this stuff, man. We want our children to be brought up in grace, not in legalism. You know, we, want, we don't want our children to be brought up in religion. We, because here's the reason why. We don't want to have to have them go through the same things that you and I have had to go through. Much of our walk with God is unlearning the past. And if you don't have a past to unlearn, just think how far ahead they're going to be. That's why I'm, these young people, like Jeff Turner, who's going to be here ministering next week, they're coming up out of, out of this stuff. Man, they're, 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 they're being set free, and they're going to influence. They're going to influence the body of Christ in ways that some of us old fogies are never going to be able to do. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about you young guys here, you young guys and gals here in our congregation and the opportunities that you have to share this stuff and the lives that you're going to totally affect. So the river of God, the river of God is really the river of grace. You cannot, and I'm going to say this, you cannot, if you're a pastor right now watching this video, you pastor, you cannot have lasting revival in your church without first understanding the revelations of new covenant grace. You can't do it. It won't last. It'll be here today and gone tomorrow. I don't care how many manifestations you're having. I don't care how many miracles you have. Thank God for that. That, that, that has nothing to do with it. I'm talking about lasting transformation in people's lives. And one of the things that I'm seeing and, and you all are like the experiment here. I'm watching your lives and the testimonies coming from you people and some of the things that are happening in your lives. And you are a living witness, a living testimony that what we're preaching, and, and this is the same message that Paul preached, is working. It's working. And you know what? Back in the old revival days, it would be here today, gone tomorrow. Well, what we're finding out, it's not gone anymore. It's only growing, and it's getting better and better. Gooderer and gooderer and gooderer, huh? Amen? So here's, here's the river of God. 
the river of grace, Ezekiel 47.1. We covered this pretty extensively last week, but just to read it for review. In my vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple and passing to the right of the altar on its south side. We discovered last week that this river flows from God. The temple comes from God himself. Verse 2, the man brought me outside the wall through the north. This was an angel, by the way, brought Ezekiel to this. The man brought me outside the wall through the north gateway and led me around to the eastern entrance. There I could see the water flowing out through the south side of the east gateway. Measuring as he went, he took me along the stream for 1,750 feet. Your King James talks about cubits. We're using the New Living Translation here. It's talking about 1,750 feet, so you know what those cubits measure up to. And then led me across the water was up to my ankles. He measured off another 1,750 feet and led me across again. This time the water was up to my knees. After another 1,750 feet, it was up to my waist. Then he measured another 1,750 feet, and the river was too deep to walk across. It was deep enough to swim in, but too deep to walk through. Now, I want to just say something here, and this is very, very important, because I've touched on this before. Especially to those of you, maybe those of you that are viewing, but those of you that are here, if you're struggling somewhat with getting a hold of this grace message, it is partially part of, the reason is, is because of our past teaching, the, the things that we were taught in previous churches or previous lives, you know, going back, whatever it is, um, from their past, okay? And, and we try to bring that, and, and it doesn't work, and it, it doesn't flow. So what I, I really believe, that in order to understand grace, it takes a revelation from the Holy Spirit. It really does. It takes a whole, because you're not going to understand it with a natural mind, because it doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's too easy, because we've all been taught that religion is too hard. We've all been taught performance-orientated, basic Christianity, haven't we? If you do this, then God will do that for you. If you pray enough, then your prayers are going to be answered. Amen? Well, what we're discovering, this is nothing against prayer because we believe in prayer, but we look at it a whole different way. Prayer, for instance, to us is no longer a crowbar trying to get God to do something for us. Prayer to us is now declaring what Jesus Christ already did on the cross. See, Jesus said his last words on the cross, it is finished. So we are no longer trying to work up and try to be what in fact we already are. If you're trying to be holy, guess what? You're going to fail. If you're trying to be righteous, you're already going to fail. You're going to fail. If you're trying to live by the Ten Commandments, I got news for you, you're going to fail. It's impossible. And God knows that. He knows that. And he knew that 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ went to the cross. His blood was shed for us so that we now, according to the scriptures, what? We now what? Instead of trying to be righteous, when we understand grace, what do we understand? We understand that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And what, what, what did you all do to dig it that way? Does anybody know? What did you, you if you tried, you failed. You, you, and, and, and guess what? This is Larry's law about law. All right, this is a law. This is my law about any kind of law. When you try to follow God according to any law, there's only going to be three things that are going to follow that performance. It's going to be fear, shame, and condemnation. Because here's the reason. You can't do it. You can't do it. So quit trying. Quit trying to be what, in fact, we already are. Does that make any sense to you? In other words, it's the simple, it's the easy and light life that Jesus promised. But the church has got us work, 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 you know. Come on, brother, straighten up. Do this, do that. Don't do this, don't do that. And the list goes on and on and on. And, and, and here we are just kind of sailing. You know, we, our songs, we changed some of the words, Chris, uh, change, uh, you know, rest, no longer seeking. The, we just rest in Jesus Christ. See? He says, I am the vine. This is our little motto here. I am the vine. You are the branches Therefore, rest. I am the vine. Huh? You are the branches. Does the grapevine struggle 
to produce fruit? Or does it just produce fruit because the branch is attached to the vine? Come on, rest. We're attached to the vine. What did we do to get attached to the vine? We didn't do it. You can't do anything to be attached to the vine. The, 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 the branch, the, what does a branch do to get attached to that grapevine? Man, I've got to pray certain prayers here. I've got to live a certain life to be attached and on and on. You know, it's attached because of what? That's the way God created it to be. I want you to know something. God created you and I to be attached to him through Jesus Christ. That's our destiny. That's what Jesus Christ has done for us. And guess what happens? When we realize that, we don't have to really strive any longer to bring that fruit to bear. It just begins to happen. It just begins. But, but it may be slow at first because there is a revelation process that takes place. And you begin to see things. And this is what happened with Corinne and I as we began to come into this message here a few years ago. We began, to, oh my gosh, all of a, I, I've been reading this all my life. You know, I, I was ordained in the ministry in 1976. So this is not my first rodeo, you know. We've been around this block for many, many years. And all of a sudden, my Bible, my Bible became a brand new book. It's things like, I've, I've seen that before, but... It really says that, and we would talk about that, and we, we would say, come on, we, sometimes we'd kind of argue back and forth, not in a harsh way, but, you know, well, she said, I don't really see, or I'd say, I don't really see, and, and we kind of get into that a little bit, but we began to work it out and said, but you know what, this is what it says, and then we would take it in context with other verses, and man, it was just amazing what would happen. And we'd go, I can remember some nights just going to bed, like we'd go to bed, we'd be on cloud nine, because Wow, I've never seen that before after all these years. You see? And so much of it, I'm telling you, so much of it is what I, uh, goes against what I was taught in Bible college and in, in different classes and different things. So here we are. It's progressive. It takes a revelation. And then the result, he said, in verse 6, he says, Have you been watching, son of man? I believe, again, that's the question for today in today's church. Have you been watching? Are you really watching? Or are you just swallowing hook, line, and sinker what your pastor teaches you? And, you know, some, some people are afraid to question their pastor even, you know. Woo. Have you been watching, son of man? And then he led me back along the river bank, and when I returned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of the river. Then he said to me, this river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. Now see this. You, you see yourself as the Dead Sea. All right, dry and salty, no life, right? We all know people that have been there. We maybe have been there ourselves at one time. But this river flows east through the desert into the Dead Sea, into the Valley of the Dead Sea. The water of the stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. There will be swarms of living things where the water of this river flows. Fish will abound in the Dead Sea. I like that. Any place that fish abound, I like. Probably all big bass, like we're going to find out tomorrow. Yeah, right? Life will flourish wherever this water flows. Fishermen will stand along. Now, again, this is the Dead Sea. How many know in the Dead Sea there's no fish? Fish can't live there. Why? It's all salt. Can't live. But, but God's river is going to change that around. All right? Life will flourish wherever this river of water flows. The fishermen will stand along the shores of the Dead Sea all the way from Engedi to Engelium. The shores will be covered with nets drying in the sun. Fish of every kind will fill the Dead Sea just as they fill the Mediterranean. But, here we go, the warning, but the marshes and the swamps will not be purified. They will still be salty. And I would like to just submit to you that the dead religious dried up churches of institutionalism, the life will flee from that place. Too much salt. Too much salt. Fruit trees, verse 12. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow along both sides. You know what? I just want to say this. I don't care how large your church is. You can have a mega church and it can be dead as last year's bird's nest. Come on. Size has nothing. We got this thing in America that unless your church is a you know, huge mega church, you got to have 1,000, 2,000. When you have a church of a couple thousand people, then people will start listening to you. 
You see, little churches like ours, who's he? You know, who does he think he is? You know, but it has nothing to do with size. Nothing to do with size. It has everything to do with the spirit, the content within. All right? So some of the mega churches can be um, just, just as dead. I, there was some, some stuff on YouTube here the other day about some of the... Uh, some of the churches and they were going into their worship and got, they got all the, the smoke machines and, and all, all this kind of stuff, all these high tech, different things. And you know, we are all for technology here, as you all know, but, but to make an atmosphere, to create the atmosphere that maybe God's really into this thing, um, listen to me, we don't need a smoke machine working here to prove that God's in it. Because to prove that that's his presence, his presence is here because we all bring his presence. Amen? So it makes no difference if you feel it or don't feel it. It's still the presence of God. All right? But um, fruit trees of all kinds will grow along both sides of the river. The leaves of these trees will never turn brown and fall. And there will, be always, there will always be fruit on their branches. There you go. There you go. There's always going to be fruit on that grapevine. Always going to be fruit on it. In the river of grace, there will always be fruit on the vine. In the river of grace, there will always be fruit produced and manifested in your life. Always. Sometimes you may not even see it, but it'll be there. Others will see it. It'll be there. There will always be fruit on their branches. There will be a new crop every month, for they are watered by the river flowing from the temple. The river, the fruit will be for food and the leaves for healing. Skip with me now over to Revelation tw chapter 22. This looks at the river from a different point of view, from John's point of view. Uh, last chapter of Revelation. Revelation chapter 22 verse 1. This is not as long, but I just wanted to show it to you. Um, then the angel showed me a river from the water, with the water of life clear as crystal, flowing from the throne and of the Lamb the Lamb being Jesus. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop every month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. Almost a carbon copy there to Ezekiel 47, right? No longer will there be a curse upon anything for the throne of God and the Lamb will be there and his servants will worship him. Let me just point something out to you. Um, this is talking about, see, in, in the, some people don't understand this. And some people, unfortunately, even in the grace movement, don't understand this. But this, this is the way I see it, okay? And, and this and $1.50 will buy you a cup of coffee. But this is the way I see it. You may agree with me, you may disagree, whatever, you know. But this is the way I see it. All right. We are, the moment we come into this revelation of Jesus Christ in our lives, all right? We call it salvation or whatever we want to call it. But the moment we come into this revelation of Jesus Christ, we spiritually have entered into the kingdom of God. Immediately. We're immediately born into the kingdom of God. Saying that, there will be a day one day when it will no longer just be spirit. Now, I want you to know something. This spiritual experience is real. It's as real as if it's a physical experience. But saying that, there will one day be a physical experience when we will see this manifested. When this, we will actually see this with our natural eyes, not our spiritual eyes. Right now we're seeing in part, we know in part, because that which is perfect has not yet come. By the way, that which is perfect is not the Bible, it's Jesus Christ. Come on. A lot of people throw off the gifts of the Holy Spirit and this kind of thing. They know these things are not needed anymore because that which is perfect was come and they'll point to the Bible. I want you to know that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about the perfect one being the Bible. The perfect one is the author of the Bible, Jesus himself. Can you say amen? Very important to understand. So we see spiritually the kingdom of God. We are in the kingdom now. We are kingdom people now, okay? We are just as much in the kingdom of God now as we'll ever be in, an art, in, an, in, in all of eternity. I want you to know that you are a kingdom person. You are a kingdom person. You are as much as you'll ever be. But saying that, 
<clears throat> there will be a physical day when it's not going to be a spiritual thing. It'll be spiritual and physical both together, and, and we will begin to see that. We will see this river of God with not our spiritual eyes, but with our natural eyes. We will see it. Okay? Now, some people reject this, you know, and people that would teach preterism and some of these things, they would reject this. They say this is all happening, <clears throat> but it's already happened. It all happened at 70 AD. It, it didn't. This is things that are going to take place one day. But saying that, see where some of these people get mixed up on it is they don't understand. They, they reject dispensational teaching. And for instance, there, we've got a lot of people that are looking for a pre-tribulation rapture and, and they're escapists and all this kind of thing. People are, well, you know, all my troubles are going to be over with when, when I'm raptured. I want you to know all your troubles ended when Jesus died at the cross. Come on. So we're not escapists. And, and some people reject that dispensationalist teaching of the pre-tribulation rapture and don't understand that there's other views on the rapture. I believe there one day will be a rapture, you know. There one day, but there, I also have to believe that what 24, Matthew 24 says, there is going to be a day when things are going to happen, okay? I don't want to get into all that now, but, but, but I want you to see that there will be a day. So the kingdom of God is twofold. The kingdom is now and it is forever, okay? It is spiritual and it will be physical for all of eternity. But you are as much a kingdom being as you are now. I was thinking about this as I watched the... the um, the circus performance that was taking place Thursday night on TV. <laughs> Shoo! I am so glad. I am so glad that my hope is not in Republicans. <clears throat> and I got news for you. My hope surely isn't in Democrats either. And you may be an independent, and my hope isn't in that as what my hope is in one person. I, I want you to know this, and I can't say this, and I'm going to show you something here in a minute. Uh, I, I can't say this enough. My king is just. My king rules for, uh, from love. I am a member of that. I, am, I live in the United States of America. I am going to vote. I am going to do what I'm supposed to do. I believe that, you know, I'm going to, I don't know who for yet, but I know that uh, I will vote, and, and I'm concerned about what happens, but I'm so thankful that my king, I live in a completely different kingdom, a completely different kingdom, and there is rest, there is peace. Now let me just tell you something. When the church gets a hold of it, when the church quits politicking, come on, when the church quits politicking and gets a hold of the kingdom, we're going to see the transformation take place. Now, I'm, I'm going to prove this to you from the, the New Testament here in a minute. But, but, but you see this? This river is going to be a real place one day. Turn with me to, um, turn with me to Ezekiel 30. You don't want to... I'm not going to go there just for the sake of time because um, this could take up the whole thing. And I want to show you because I've already opened this can of worms. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. If you get a chance, read Ezekiel chapter 36, um, I believe 1 through 16, and, and, and take a look at that when you get home today and, and just begin to look at that. That's again old covenant, old teaching. God says, listen, I'm just going to give you a synopsis on it. God said that the children of Israel messed up so badly, they sinned so badly, that they brought shame upon God. Therefore, God punished them. All right? He dispersed them. And God scattered them. And so here they are. They're scattered to the nations. And God's watching them. And what do they do? Instead of getting their lives right, they're still messing up. And God says in Ezekiel 37 here, he said, 36, he says, listen, he says, you're still messing up. And here's what these people are saying. These, these people in these countries are saying, they're, they're mocking me because they're saying, here's this holy God, and these are supposed to be his people, and they're all messing up. 
He says, this isn't good. It's not working. Because people are going to mess up because they're people. If you have not discovered that yet, you know, you can talk about Supreme Court decisions, you can talk about this, you can talk about some of these things the politicians have done. Here's what you have to understand. We have a bunch of unregenerated people making decisions that are not spiritual decisions. So I don't expect anything different than some of the, the Supreme Court rulings. I, I don't like them. But I cannot expect too much different because these are the people who are making those decisions. That's the way it's always been. And that's what God said. These people, they go out, even when punishment's upon them, they're punished. And, and so what do they do? They continue to go out and mess up. So God says, i got to do something. He says, they're making, they're, they're, they're bringing shame to my name. And he says, they, it's obvious they can't live this way anymore. They, they, they can't do it because they cannot do it right. So therefore, he says, I'm going to make them a brand new way. In Je Jeremiah, he talks about, in 31, he talks about what? He says, and the day will come when I will give them a new covenant. Why? Because God knew, he watched them, they could not live under the old covenant. They couldn't make it. And it says, I'm going to make a way for them. It's going to be the easy and light life. They're still going to mess up. But he says, I'm not going to judge their sin and lawless deeds anymore because they can't do anything other than that. There's all kinds of stuff going on today. You read some books, folks, that scare you half to death. Matthew sent me some links this week. And I mean, some of this stuff, I mean, you read some of this stuff, you believe some, you know what, I'm going to tell you some of what some of these guys are doing. They're, they're writing books and they're just making a lot of money. And it's amazing how many people follow this stuff, hook, line, and sinker. People are worried about the blood moons. They're saying, there's one particular famous Bible teacher right now that's basically saying the rapture is going to take place on September 28th. Oh, is that, I read that in my Bible too, Jim. But, but that's what, the, the, I mean, I, this guy's famous. He's famous from Houston, Texas. <laughs> the blood moons. You know what? I could get, you know what? Here's the deal. I'm going to tell you something. Judgment. Do you, do you see this? When you, when you read this Ezekiel 36 thing, maybe we, ought to, we should have read it, but, but, but just believe me, it's there. You, you read it for yourself. When you get into this Ezekiel 36 thing, I'm going to tell you something. Judgment didn't work then, and it's not going to work now. God knows that. And that's why Jesus said in, in come on, in, in Matthew 6, he said, look, I have come not to what? Judge the world. Look at, come on, look at, at verse 7. You know, I have not come to judge the world, but what? That the world through me would what? Be saved. I'm going to tell you something. America is not under judgment. America's messed up because people are messing up. People are doing stupid things. <coughs> and God has nothing to do with it. Uh, sure, got to blame it on somebody. Exactly right. <laughs> oh, do I have your attention? Turn, turn with me. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. Let's close this thing up. <clears throat> Again, make sure you read that Ezekiel 36 thing. <laughs> but when you begin to understand grace, this is this river of God. When you understand this thing... <clears throat> Chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Since you have been, I love the way the New Living Translation puts it here. Since you have been, past tense, amen? Since you have been raised to new life with Christ. You know, do you understand this? This is where the river is up there. The river is so deep, we're swimming in it. You can't, you can't wade in this thing anymore. When you begin to understand this stuff, when this stuff begins to get down in your gut of guts, guess what? You're swimming, brother and sister. You're, you're out there. You're so far out over your head. 
Now, we have a swimming pool at home. Our swimming pool is a little over six feet. I can go down, I can stand on the bottom, and it's a little bit over my head, you know? And that, that, that's where I sometimes feel like I'm in this river. I'm out there swimming, and it's up over my head. But here's where the depth of the revelation is. I realize, here's one thing that, I'm going to tell you something. Here's one thing that I have realized, folks. I, I know this, that I know this, that I know this. And, and no matter what comes against me, no matter what goes wrong in my life, Larry Silverman knows this truth. And you talk about bringing me victory in life, you know. But when you know this truth, Guess what? You're gonna, you don't need revival. You, you walk in constant revival because that's where the life is. Hallelujah. Since you have been, past tense, raised to new life with Christ. See, I know without a shadow of a doubt that I have been raised to new life with Jesus Christ. That's where I live, folks. You can, you can come against me. Now, that doesn't mean sometimes you can't get my flesh riled up. One of the things that all of the leaders in our church have, have one time or another seen me when my flesh has been a little riled up, you know. And I've watched them as their flesh gets riled up once in a while too. But, but the thing that is, is that it don't last long. And guess what? The longer more we begin to see that out there in that depth, our flesh just doesn't have too much to do anymore. And it gets less and less riled up all the time. You know, I just know this. I've been raised to new life with Christ. I rest in this. You see? I have constant peace. Now look at this. Set your sights. Here we go, folks. Here we go, Here we go Americans, during this election season. Set your sights on the reality. Set your sights. What does that mean? Those of us that know anything about shooting, you know, you're adjusting the sights on your rifle. If you have a huge deer walk out there 100 yards from now, uh, from here, and your rifle is only sighted in for 35 yards, guess what probably will happen? You know, you're going to miss that. You're going to go over, under, to the right, to the left. You're going to miss, and there goes your venison steak dinner. All right? Set your sights on the realities of heaven. That does not say... Set your sights on the things that you see with your natural eyes happening all around you. Because when you do that, when you set your sights upon these natural things, guess what happens? You lose the peace of God that passes all understanding. I really, I, listen to me, I really advise people, if you can't handle it, then stay away from things like Fox News and CNN and those, those news channels. Turn that stinking TV off and go watch an old-time black-and-white movie uh, of John Wayne or something, you know? You'll be doing yourself a whole lot better, all right? Since you have been raised to new life with Jesus Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ, now didn't we talk about this kingdom thing, see? Where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Verse 2, think about what? The things of heaven, not the things of earth. What are we going to think about? The things of heaven, not of earth. All right? You're going through some financial struggles. What do you think about? You go, you're going through some health issues. What do you think about? You know, hey, I've been there. You know, I've known what it's been. I've been in, I've had pain in my body. And well, you know what? You don't become very spiritual at those times. But what we do is we train ourselves. We begin to train ourselves. We renew our minds to the truths of God's word. And we begin to train ourselves. We take the little battles of life and we overcome the little battles of life via the Spirit of God, via this kingdom thinking, by this new way. We begin to come up with these little problems in life, and we apply the dynamic of rest to the little problems of life, and guess what begins to take place? See? Here's what we're trying to teach you here, that the spirit things, that these things of the new covenant of grace. These things begin in our very gut of guts. They don't begin up here because up here you can begin to talk yourself out of it. You can think yourself out of this stuff. 
It's one of the things we talked about here a couple weeks ago on Wednesday night. I, I mentioned, you know, teaching. Emmett was bringing up some stuff about walking and living in the Spirit, listening to the Spirit in life. And one of my, I followed up that next Sunday. He was out of town, and so I followed up that next uh, Wednesday night with uh, how do we hear the Spirit of God, you see? How do we listen? How do we hear the Spirit of God? How does the Spirit speak to us? Through the Word and through things of life, through counsel from our brothers. And so different ways, you know, that the Spirit, through the still, small voice, but that still, small voice is the one that I think that oftentimes is applied and that Emmett seems to have operating in his life. That all of a sudden that, that impression comes to you. You know, that, that little impression comes to you. And, and here's what I shared on that. You run with the first impression that comes to you. Don't pry, because as soon as you start thinking, guess what happens? You're going to mess yourself up. Try to figure it out. I've got news for you. You can't do it. Run with the very first thought. I'm going to tell you something. That first thought that comes to your mind nine times out of ten is God. Now, that's not a 100% rule, but I'll bet you it's 90%. That first thought, that first impression, that first whatever, that's the voice of God coming to you. And then you begin to think. And I all shared with you how deer hunting one time, and on a, a strong, windy, rainy day, hunting in a place where I was very, for just a few days, bow hunting, I saw this huge buck, I knew it was going to be mine, opening day, and I didn't have a lot of time to hunt that year. I had to get some venison and be done with it. And, and this buck, I had seen him out bow hunting, never was able to get a shot at him. I knew exactly where he was running. I knew exactly what his patterns were. I woke up that November 16th, uh, opening day of deer season, 15th, 15th in Michigan. Deer 16th is my brother's birthday. I woke up that morning. It was stormy and rainy. The wind was blowing. Everything was wrong. And oh, boy. And I had to go out anyway. And I went out there, and I'm where normally that buck would have come through. Guess what happened? And, and I'm thinking to myself, and I feel like the Spirit is saying, or I feel like this voice is coming to me, go over yonder, probably about another 200 yards, into some real thick bush. You know, it was real thick. And I, oh, man, I'm cold, I'm wet, I'm just, it's not, you know, he'll come right through here. Well, it was the voice of God telling me to go over yonder because guess where? I, I, and I was able to see it. I was able to see, I heard some gunshots coming down from a hill over there and coming down toward the swamp and this huge, I mean, it was like this, this buck had two grain shovels on his head, just huge rack. And he comes busting through there, branches breaking, you know, just making all kinds of noise, nothing. And if I would have been over where the Lord told me to be, guess what? Though they had been hanging on my wall. Right. Right in the living room. <laughs> that's where my, that 10-pound bass we're going to catch tomorrow, guess where that's going. You know? yeah. I didn't listen. And guess what? That year I even had a doper. I couldn't even shoot a doe. I, had no, I couldn't even get nothing that year. So, see, had I listened... It would have been all over with by 8 o'clock opening morning had I listened. And that's what happens. But you begin to think. That first impression, if I would have followed that first impression, it would have been all over. So are you guys getting anything out of this? Is this helping? See, we, we, we are, you know, we live in this world. We live in this world. But, man, we are kingdom people, folks. We are kingdom people. And when you begin to understand that, the kingdom of God comes how? It's what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It comes from the application of rest. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, look at this, when Christ who is your life is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. Now, can you guys get your hands on that? Can you get your thinking around that? Sharing in the glory of God? Sharing in the glory of Christ? My lands. I, I, can't even, I can't even begin to go there. I can't even begin to fathom what that must be like. But it's there, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen to all of us. It's going to take place. We are going to share in God's glory, you and I. We are heirs of Christ. 
We are heirs of Christ. And that is going to be an awesome, awesome, awesome time. That's the river of God, folks. That's the river of God. That's the river of God being manifested. And how many know when, if you can get your, your grippers, your spiritual grippers, on that Colossians 3 passage there, if you can get your grippers on that, you're never going to need revival. You start believing that with everything that's within you, you, you don't need to be, I mean, there, there's life there. There's life there that, that will just never go away, and it's only going to increase, increase, increase. Is that okay? Um, I'm excited. I'm excited. You know what? I'm excited about America. I'm excited about our country. And I'm going to tell you why. It may not look good. It may not look good to the natural eye. But I'm excited because here's why. I believe you and I, forget the America thing, we are living in the church's finest hour. We're going to do great things in these days that lie ahead. And the worst, I expect it to get bad out there. I expect it to get bad. I expect there to be these things that are, are coming down. I expect it. Why? Because that's the way it's always been. That's the way it's always going to be. But it's just making a way for us to be the overcomers that we are. And you know what happened in the early church? Guess what happened? They shared Jesus. Their lives were transformed. They were being persecuted. They were being thrown to lions. They were, and none of us have had those kinds of things happen. You talk about bad government? Come on. Look at the bad government that the Roman church had. And the things that they had to put up with. It makes some of our things look like marshmallows. We, none of us have had been thrown to the lion's den yet. You know? <laughs> Who knows? Maybe we will. But here's what took place. You see, in the middle of all that, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ prospered. And people's lives were transformed. And the change began to take place all around that known world. That's exactly what's going to go happen. I just, I'm just telling you something. Watch my words. Just mark my words. You know, I'm, I'm going to stand by this. We are in for the church's finest hour. I am so thankful to be alive at this time. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So, Father, I, I just thank you. I just praise you, Lord, for who you are and for what you're doing. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came and that you died on that cross for each and every one of us, Lord, that we can come to you to the finished works of the cross, and therefore, Father, we can find that peace and that rest. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you, that you are our king. That you are the king of all kings. That you are our king. And in you, we find peace. In this world, we're never going to find peace. But in you, Lord Jesus, we're going to find total peace. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Father, I pray your blessings upon all these people. I pray that you bless those that would be watching around the world via YouTube today. Whatever your needs are, I don't, you know, whatever country you're living in, you have your stories that you can share, the horror stories, just like we can share. But there, there too, you are citizens of a higher kingdom. And we thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our lives and their lives. Jesus' mighty name. Amen.